Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's webinar, where we will be discussing the role of the marketing director at a football club. It is our great pleasure to have Marcus Bregleck, the former director of marketing and media at Liverpool FC. Ma Marcus, welcome. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm really excited to be around and uh, being able to connect to everybody online. So I'm um, glad to be here, and hopefully we can and have a good discussion and answer a few questions and give some insights. Fantastic. So let me start with uh, just some brief introductions. Um, for those of you who may have not attended any of our webinars before, my name is Diego Valdez. I'm the director at the Sports Business Institute Barcelona. And what we do is we specialize in providing training for those that want to start, advance, develop their career in the business side of football. Uh, from time to time, we run these live webinars where we have conversations with decision makers, executives, and um, industry professionals. So tonight, we have the, the honor of having Marcus Bregleck, as I mentioned before, who uh, is the former director of marketing and media of, at Liverpool FC. I'm briefly going to run through some uh, housekeeping details, but they won't take very long because what we want to do is we want to dive into the conversation as soon as possible. So I'll get, um, I'll get going with those rather quickly, and then we can uh, start the conversation. First thing, however, um, we always like to just make sure that the sound is coming through OK on your end. Um, so what we'd like you to, to do is if, if you could put in the chat box OK, and also put where you're connecting from, uh, because we like to see where our audience is connecting from. So tell us the city or the country where you're connecting from in the chat box. You have an option there to type in. So just so we know that the sound is coming through on your side, if you can just type OK and the country, the city, where you're connecting from, and just um, we'll uh, be monitoring that so to make sure. OK, excellent. So we see people from England. We have Belgium on the call. We have Brazil, Porto, Salzburg. OK, fantastic. Sao Paulo, Bulgaria. Excellent. Wow, so the list goes on. Qatar. Uh, Caracas, Venezuela, Sydney, Australia. Excellent. So great to see that, as per usual, our audience is uh, global and uh, that you guys are connecting from all different time zones. So we really do appreciate you taking the time to join us for the conversation. As far as the structure for tonight's webinar, well, um, in just a moment, we're going to start the conversation with Marcus. We're going to begin with a couple of moderated questions that uh, we've already prepared, but there's just two or three questions that we're, um, that we're going to get this conversation started with. Um, but what we're really interested in is turning the floor over to you guys tonight, because it's not every day that you have access to um, an executive with the experience of Marcus. So um, what we want to do is give you the floor and have you guys ask the questions so that Marcus can um, address them as we move forward. Um, in the meantime as well, what we'll do is we'll talk briefly about our master program, which is starting in October, October 21st, and where in fact Marcus is gonna play an important role as an academic advisor, as a lecturer, and as a career mentor. But we'll go into that a little bit later on in the conversation tonight. So that being said, um, we're really excited to get this going. So. Uh, Marcus, let's, uh, let's begin the conversation tonight, as I'm sure all of our uh, attendees are, are eagerly waiting for us to begin. So the first question that uh, we had prepared and uh, wanted to ask you is, to, if you could share your path as to how you became the Director of Marketing and Media at LFC, because there's people out there that have that ambition to work at a football club, to work in the marketing department, and who may be wondering, well, how do I get my opportunity? So perhaps if you, if you can tell us how you started and how you um, ended up in the position of um, marketing director uh, uh, at LFC. Sure, absolutely. Um, pleasure. A lot, of, a lot of pressure with the entire world listening. Fantastic. Um, so, well, ultimately it all starts with, with passion, right? So I've always been a, a passionate and positively addicted football fan. Um, I played myself, um, and I can assure you nothing of any talent or greatness that would have taken me anywhere close to football pitch. So uh, having been a lifelong fan and, and watching a lot of football on TV wherever 
possible. It was very clear that I wanted to be in that world. Um, so passion was kind of the starting point. Um, based on that, I started my, my university degrees, um, did a degree in sports and marketing, and then uh, was uh, lucky and excited to land my first job at Adidas. Um, so landed in the sports industry, kind of on the way in the right direction. Um, and then uh, after a certain period of time at Adidas, I moved to Nike, where I spent uh, quite a few years, more than, more than seven years, um, in various roles in, in brand marketing, digital sports marketing, before becoming the, uh, the football category leader for, for Nike in, in EMEA and, and Northern Europe. With, uh, in a way, my, my biggest project um, was, was running the project of the 2006 World Cup activation for, for Nike, which was quite exciting because it was in my, my home country, Germany. Um, and then after, after Nike, and in, in a way close to, well, 10 and a half years in the direct sports industry, um, I, then, I then moved outside of sports, um, I thought, and um, moved into the digital world where I uh, was basically hitting up marketing teams for Sony and HTC, uh, various marketing leadership roles across um, the, the space of digital media, marketing, advertising, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then obviously also running the sport sponsorship sites for, for these companies on a, on a regional or on a global basis. So kind of back, back in football, as I thought I had just left football, I was back very swiftly and quickly. Um, so that was, that was nice and positive because we were dealing with a whole array of, of clubs, of athletes, and interesting properties such as FIFA, um, the UEFA Champions League and Euro uh, Europa League as well. So that was really an interesting path. And also looking at football from a sponsor's perspective, looking at it from a different perspective. So the first, time, the first element was directly in sports. The second one was in a non-sports brand, looking at football and how it was activated. And then after about 19 years in, in, in total, um, the opportunity came up to, um, to join Liverpool Football Club, which was always my English passion club, if you want. Um, and that was obviously a, a great and exciting opportunity because it was their first marketing and media director role. And uh, when it came up, it was pretty clear for me that I wanted to pursue it and was lucky enough to, to get the role. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what it was. It was basically what I think qualified me potentially for the role. I believe was was the different dimensions of sports marketing and football that I've seen on the on the sports brand side, the digital and non-sports brand side, but then also partially on the agency side because I worked in, in player man management and athlete management as well, running an agency. So I think that holistic element was hopefully what qualified me for the role. So um, there I landed. Well, it's been interesting to hear your path because, uh, like I said, a lot of our audience is uh, keen to understand, well, how does one get a position at a, at a top sports property and uh, one with such global magnitude, such as LFC, even more so. So uh, it really is interesting to hear how your path took you from, you know, the apparel world and then into uh, other sports marketing roles, uh, but always staying in the industry and, uh, and evidently until uh, until uh, the role at Liverpool Football Club. Now, um, the next question, Marcus, that um, we wanted to tackle tonight is, what are the main functions of a director of marketing or director of marketing and media at a football club? Well, in, in a way, to a certain degree, they are the same functions and actually the same setup as in, in any brand, you could argue. But then football, as we would always say, is fundamentally different. So it's same, same, but fundamentally different in a way. In, in a way, it all starts with, uh, you know, setting the vision, the mission, the objectives, the key priorities, and the commercial metrics for, uh, for the club, and basically create a holistic club and brand strategy um, for whichever club. And then really translating that club strategy into clear divisional strategies for brand management um, that then would touch marketing and media and all the external touch points that the club has, but also really making sure there's a lot of alignment work to be done, um, like in any, in any marketing leadership role, to make sure that other departments of the club, um, the various teams, um, 
understand their direction and the strategy, and especially also the sports side. This is where it's very different in a football club. Obviously, the, the football and the sports side, they're very focused on w winning on the pitch, which is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, at the same time, it's important that the sports side understands what we need to do from a brand, club, and commercial perspective in order to feel, fulfill the needs of our partners. So it's vital that as, as a marketing and media team, we brief the sports side properly so they're not surprised when we're coming at them with, uh, with questions and requests all the time. Um, so really aligning that strategy that has been created is key, making sure everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet. And then ultimately, further alignment with our commercial partners. Um, they're obviously hugely important, important for any football club. Um, making sure that commercial partners of the football club understand exactly where the club is going. Um, A, to align their own activation opportunities to that, and then B, to create new ones together and really make sure we have a chance to, to build greatness, greatness together or clubs build greatness together with their partners. Um, and then last but not least, it's really about delivering and implementing the strategy and managing the team or the different teams and different functions towards a consistent implementation. That touches um, the different areas of, of the organization in a, in a media marketing organization at the football club, for example, brand strategy management, brand design, the research and the insights and the segmentation team um, that are all caring about the targeting and the management of the different audiences, um, brand activation and campaign management, as well as marketing operations, the data side of things, how do we operate in the space of data management, insights creation, CRM and direct marketing, youth marketing, and really thinking about the next generation fan, how do we interact with an audience that doesn't enter football in, the, in, a, in a way that we all entered football when we were younger and our dad took us to, to our first games. Um, the media strategy, creating the media strategy and, and a content strategy, so really agreeing and aligning on what are the fan-facing um, activities, stories that we wanted to tell as a brand. And then also the media channel management around web, social apps. Um, some clubs have a linear TV channel, some clubs have a, an OTT channel, very much digitally focused. And then last but not least, really working closely with our partners, uh, with the partners of any club to make sure that their activation is aligned and the rights are delivered that they have bought into with a partnership uh, of a club. So that, that's kind of a, that's a lot of stuff <laughs> and it should sit under an aligned strategy and uh, it's basically a fairly all encompassing role which make, makes it exciting but it also depends on the different different teams to make sure they all pull into the same direction. Really interesting. Um, that's, uh, that's quite a lot of detail that you've gone into, and I'm sure that as, uh, by the way, if you just joined us, there, uh, there's going to be an opportunity for you guys to ask your questions to Marcus, so uh, I'm sure that uh, many of the points that you've discussed, some of our audience will want to um, dive a little bit deeper, um, so we'll, uh, we'll get to that a little bit later on, but... Uh, it's really interesting to hear as a whole the different functions that you've outlined for us. Moving on, um, a lot of times we uh, also want to know well, what's next, right? What are some of the future trends? So based on your experience and what you know about the industry, what do you envision will be the future trends or the important places where we should you know, keep an eye out for uh, moving forward? Well, I, I think Ultimately, there mo most of them are fairly obvious, but then there is a couple that are maybe um, more surprising in, in the football world. So the obvious ones are digital strategy and digital capability as a whole is very, very important for any football club around the world. I think football has been a little bit slower, maybe a little more complacent and maybe a little more conservative than, than some other some other sports when it really comes to the digital transformation. So some clubs have gone on that journey already. Others are pretty much um, on the way and thinking about it and others haven't even touched it yet. So that whole complex of a holistic digital strategy um, around data intelligence, making sure that the club is set up from a clear digital proposition perspective, understanding what fans want um, and making sure they have a proposition 
and the uh, the data and digital capability to deliver to deliver the, to those needs. Um, E-commerce is obviously part of that. Holistic mobile experiences are key. So that's the whole area around digital proposition and digital strategy. That's not really a trend. That's something that has started years ago. But it, it's definitely something that will continue to grow and will continue to drive the industry into modernization. Um, the second part is really the changing media landscape that we're all experiencing on, a, on an everyday basis. Uh, it's basically an ever-evolving, fast-paced beast, which will have, which will have an impact on, on the media rights business on the business that football clubs um, can do and how they structure their, their media output and their content and how they structure themselves for the future in order to make sure that they're ready for new players entering the media market, um, challenging the existing world order when it comes to how media and how content is being delivered. Because ultimately, football is working like an, like an entertainment business and that is a very fast-paced environment. Um, and I, I always felt that football, again, was a little bit slower than some other sports. If you look at martial arts or what basketball is doing in, in this area of new and innovation, uh, new and innovative media concepts, um, I think football has a job to do. Um, the, the, ha the next, I, I would say it's also already a developed journey rather than a trend, is that the football consumption habits are really changing especially the youth audience, the next generation fan, are coming at football from a completely different entry point. Um, in the past, when, when we, were, we were young, um, our dads took us, um, hand, we got a shirt handed and a flag, and from that moment we were a fan of a certain club. That, that has obviously completely changed, and the entry point for many young fans is gaming. And through gaming, they touch football more from an individual player-focused perspective rather than identifying their team. So that is a different way of coming into the game. So there's a job for clubs to do to make sure that whoever comes into the game at a young age um, is, is connected to the club when they, when they come into the world. Um, there is other, maybe two other areas where I feel there is a real opportunity for clubs to make a difference. Um, it, it's, it's something that they need to do in order to be future-proof and to really have a competitive advantage going forward. And some clubs are really on a good journey there, and others, I think, need to step it up a little bit. Um, the one thing is really building a better, fully integrated mobile experience. I think mobile experiences um, in football clubs currently appear to be still fragmented, still basically um, on, on a foundation of what a club has built in the past. Uh, new apps are coming in, new ideas are coming in, and there's a ever-growing amount of stuff from a digital perspective that clubs are creating. And that can be confusing to fans. So to take a step back and say, okay, what is actually the entire fan journey? What is actually the need for the fan and putting putting themselves into the fan's shoes is key to make sure they create a holistic mobile journey. And I think there are still loads of opportunity for every club um, out there to improve. And maybe there's one final point um, for in, in the football industry, which is all around creative culture. There's a lot of talk about the technology change that's, that's happening, the technology that is needed to to, to be able to compete and to be able to grow the football business. Um, technology is one element. Um, I, I think there is a huge opportunity for clubs, again, to take a step back and really define their digital proposition first, understand how fans interact with the club in the digital space, and then think about the creative output and the innovative output in the space of social media or apps or channels. Um, and really that creative differentiation is something that, that will take clubs to other places. So I really believe in the fact that creativity and innovation and being a little more daring um, and brave as clubs will give, give clubs the opportunity to truly dif differentiate. Um, and technology will come after that. Technology will be the underlying foundation of, of all of that. And I think those are the key elements of 
what are not necessarily trends anymore, but certainly journeys that have started and clubs have to be at the forefront of in order to compete with, with other rights holders. No, it's really interesting because you've covered so many points here and uh, it, is, it is quite uh, a hot topic these days when we talk about digital transformation. As you said, it's not a trend, it's not new, but it's something that you know, we hear more and more about and the fact that you mentioned that uh, technology is, uh, is not the most important part, but rather that culture and that, that innovation within organizations. So perhaps we can uh, get into that a little bit deeper with some of the questions from our audience. But, uh, there's definitely quite a, quite a lot to unpack as we, as we move forward in the discussion. So by the way, guys, start thinking if you want to have um, any questions that you'd like to ask Marcus. I know we received several of, uh, by email as well, which we've selected quite a few. So um, like I said, tonight is about you. We want to give you the open mic, the open floor to have an opportunity to ask Marcus some questions. So we'll get to your questions um, quite soon. Another question that um, we always like to pose um, when uh, we get a chance to talk to people, um, executives in football, is their recommendation, their advice, because again, our audience in many cases is many times looking for an opportunity. They want to either start or advance a career in the business side of sport and particularly football. So. You know, they may be asking themselves, well, how can I get a role in a marketing or a sponsorship position within the industry? So um, I know you touched upon this briefly with uh, the first question when you talked about your journey, but what recommendations would you give or uh, how can people that are looking to begin a career in this field, you know, start looking at ways to optimize their opportunities? Well, first of all, I think the good news is that the, the world of sports marketing and especially in football is, is still growing. So the opportunity for, for jobs in the space is, is definitely there, especially for, for um, well-educated people, people that have had practice experiences. So that, that's, that's the good news. Um, it, is, it is not easy to get in, but I think there's probably five or six things that are, that are key. One is obviously the theory. It's important to continue to build knowledge. It's important to have a solid foundation of education, especially when it comes to the, the digital expertise, as we just mentioned before. And I think the, the courses that, that um, the SBI is, is driving um, are, are really on point to, to lay that foundation, especially also when it comes to the second point. The second point is obviously practice. So building the practical experience and making sure that um, people are not shying away from taking on internships, taking on secondments, um, open, trying to open doors and being part of conversations within football clubs, um, even if they're not at the highest level yet, but um, to really include themselves into the practical work as much as possible. So there's obviously the theory and the practice. That's not very, very surprising. Um, the next thing is obviously, building an industry network and keeping it alive. I think the second part here is really important. Um, it's sometimes easy to, to connect to many people on LinkedIn, um, but it's really how you keep an alive network, how you make sure that you continue to foster opportunities and ultimately, hopefully, find a senior mentor who can help you guide and open doors, um, give you industry experience, um, give you some cases, um, basically learning from their experiences is key. Um, the next point to me is versatility. Um, at least in my experience, I felt that the versatility of having worked in different dimensions of sports from a brand, agency, and club side to me was key um, because it opened, it opened the mind a little bit um, and it gave me the chance to look at football from, from different angles. So that versatility, um, I think, is a key point as well. And last but not least, I'm kind of repeating my first point here. It comes down to passion. Picking areas in sports or in football that you're truly passionate about. Um, it's high intensity. It's high workload. There's a lot of hours. Uh, football will never be a nine-to-five job. Um, so therefore, the, the, the passion has to be there to be able to put in the hours and listen and learn and being, being open. Um, to me, those are kind of the the key elements. Um, and I have not seen so far um, a junior employee 
that was passionate that didn't succeed in the football world because that's what it's all built about. It, it's, it, it sometimes sounds like it's a marketing job like, like any other, but it's not because the passion element is driving everything. I, I remember from my days at the Liverpool Football Club when people come in uh, on a Monday after a weekend where, where we didn't play so well, you felt it. You felt it until after lunchtime. And so that passion element is something that I would never um, underscore when it comes to what are the key traits. And I would say, finally, and, and most importantly, um, is not forgetting the North Star of everything. Besides future trends, besides business needs, besides a changing and evolving culture and audiences, one thing remains the North Star, and, and that is clubs exist for their fans, and it is being fully fan-centric that is, I think, a key element of what um, newcomers in the business or existing members of the business have to remind themselves of every day and really making sure that fulfilling the dreams of those fans um, is key, and, and that is winning football. That is winning trophies, getting silverware going, and if that is, if that is what's, what's being achieved, then ultimately fans will be extremely happy. In, in simple terms, I think there is a virtuous circle. You can talk about, you know, in a way, it's about exciting fans growing and building deep connections with the fan base. If that's happening, it leads to indirect and direct commercial growth for clubs, great. And if that commercial growth for clubs is reinvested onto the pitch, it leads to winning football and it leads to fan happiness, and there we go again. So it's a fairly simple business. Well, oh, that's great. I mean, I'm sure uh, everybody who's listening in, and especially those that want to have that um, that guidance, will understand, uh, you know, the clarity that you've provided here in uh, in those tips. Um, so, uh, yes, that's uh, many great tips. Of course, having the knowledge, the contacts, having a mentor, the experience, the versatility, and of course, the passion in that north star that you referred to. So, really good points for everybody here. Right, now what uh, we're going to do now is we're going to take um, some questions from you guys. So in the chat box, go ahead and type them in. We're also going to be taking in questions that have come in through email. So take a couple minutes, think about any particular questions. Like I said, it's not every day you guys will have access to you know, asking questions to someone with the experience of Marcus. So um, it's always a good opportunity to you know, to have that uh, moment to ask anything that you want to know. And of course, that's why we've provided this opportunity for you in this webinar. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the whole point of, um, of um, having these conversations. In the meantime, what I wanted to do while you guys put your questions in, in the chat box, I wanted to inform you about our master's program, which is our online master in football business and management that starts October 21st. And what I'll do is I'll just provide a very brief overview on it because I think it ties in into the last point that Marcus was talking about. Um, and with that, uh, you know, it'll give you a bit more time for you guys to, you know, to think about any questions that you may have. So as Marcus was saying, one of the first things that you need to do is you've got to equip yourself with the skills and the competencies. So this program has been designed you know, to do that, to bring top industry professionals such as Marcus and many others that come and deliver um, master classes with their knowledge and their practical case studies. Um, here you see a list of just a few of the people that um, have come in and passed, are coming in this year, and many more that uh, we haven't added yet, but people from all areas of sport, or football in this case, uh, sports properties such as clubs, federations, leagues. We also have agencies, player representation firms, digital marketing agencies, um, sports law firms, etc. So there's there's a wide array of speakers that look at the business side of football, as Marco was saying, from a holistic uh, perspective. Secondly, this, this program will also allow you to network, not just with your peers, many who already come from the football industry. We already have enrolled executives from clubs such as Tottenham Football Club. We have sports lawyers. We have international uh, business professionals from across various markets. Um, other club professionals as well. So you get a chance to interact with people that either already come from the industry or are looking to you know, enter it and leverage and transfer those skills that uh, they may have from other corporate sectors. 
this is just a map of some of the people that um, come uh, have come to SBI. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of yellow dots from all around the globe um, over the past you know, seven and a half years that we've been operating. A few of the clubs and uh, executives that come from these organizations. So this program does attract a certain profile that will allow you to network as we were talking before. So a lot of the organizations that you see on screen have uh, collaborated with us or sent executives from their um, particular yeah, clubs or federations or agencies or media outlets within football. So it does attract a certain level of professionals that will allow you to network. Um, as you see here on screen, this is Wes Morgan, who is uh, uh, captain of Leicester City Football Club. Uh, he studied this program with us last year and then was in Barcelona with us. So that is the picture that you see there uh, from um, the time he was with us. And like Marco was saying, mentorship, guidance. So we're going to help you with building your personal brand, giving you access to top professionals and guide you along the way. Marcus, of course, is going to form part of this program. Uh, as a mentor, as an academic advisor, and also as a guest lecturer with his expertise, as he just mentioned, in, in the different areas that he's worked within football. Finally, you do get a chance to have direct experience, something that Marcus alluded to before, because what we've done is we've arranged for student projects with organizations in the football industry. So what that means is that we've established collaboration agreements where organizations send us a challenge and a group of our students will work on it and then they'll pitch it to the club or the organization in the sports industry. So that'll give you an opportunity to work hand in hand with people that are working in clubs or federations or agencies, et cetera. And then finally, we culminate with a two day event in Barcelona, which we call our corporate football tour, where we take you guys to FC Barcelona, Espanol, Media Pro, we have a nice ceremony at the end. So if you want more information, go to sbibarcelona.com. There's more, um, more info on our master's program there. And uh, at that stage, we'll, um, we'll move on then to your questions. But uh, I thought it was a good moment for us to, you know, to share that in case you are thinking about moving into a career in the business side of football. Well, this is a program that we're offering. It's starting in one month, so there's, there's still some spots available. Applications are coming in as, uh, as we speak on a weekly basis from all across the world. So, you know, take time to read what we have on our web. And if you have any questions, just, just get in touch. But moving back to um, the topic at hand tonight, hopefully we have some questions that have come up in the chat box. So let me go ahead and um, look at what's coming through. Um, so, uh, in fact, we have a couple of questions that, it, that, that came in beforehand, and I want to ask um, one that came in particularly from Jonas Bogarts. And his question is, how open is the culture to share ideas inside a club? And I think you talked about this before, Marcus, but you know, can you share a little bit more as to what do you think is um, you know, the culture like across the industry as far as being able to share your ideas and promote you know, initiatives, particularly as, as it was the case with you, um, you know, at a, at a club like Liverpool? Well, I think there is the, the internal and the external side to this question. So internally, it's all about what kind of ideas culture you foster as a team to make sure that an idea can come from everywhere. Because I, I firmly believe that an idea doesn't only sit in the marketing team. An idea can sit anywhere in the club. Um, I, can, I can give you an example. One of our one of our one of our basically one of our brand um, mantras um, is called, or one of our brand taglines is called "We are Liverpool. This means more." The um, the idea obviously was developed by the marketing team, but ultimately it came from a conversation with people from within the club, and that got developed and then became much more because it was actually an authentic idea that was born from within the club and was real was proven and tested and loved, and all of a sudden it became much more than, than just a marketing campaign. It really became the brand position of the club. So fostering an idea culture within the club is key, um, making sure that people are, are encouraged to deliver ideas on a regular basis. And then there's the external side of things, and probably you'd be surprised how, how open clubs work with each other on certain, on certain projects. So for example, when, whenever we played 
a Champions League game, there is usually a team-to-team -team meeting before those games where relevant teams of the different marketing teams from both of the opponents at night meet in the afternoon and discuss certain, certain topics, share ideas, share opportunities, um, learn from each other. So we, we, for example, had a team to team meeting with FC Barcelona where they were interested in the setup of our TV studios because we had a, we have, have been having quite a, quite a substantial setup from a, from a linear TV channel perspective. And they were interested to see how that works. So idea sharing is definitely something that's happening. Um, could there be more? Absolutely. Is everybody taking part? No, <laughs> but it's definitely um, something that clubs are embracing also, especially in the field of research, for example, where clubs in simple terms can save money um, if they do certain research projects together, because ultimately they're after the same numbers. Um, so there is opportunities uh, of idea sharing. So it's happening, but not on a daily basis and not all the time, but um, it's a very important element of what we're trying to build more and more across the industry. Excellent. No, no, really interesting stuff. Um, another question here from Pedro Bernardes, Pedro from Portugal. Okay, excellent. So he says, hello, Marcus. I would like to know which foundations should the value proposition of a local football club have in order to increase fan engagement and brand awareness? And how different is this from a top club, say like LFC? Diego, I'm sorry, you broke off a little bit. Can you please repeat the question one more time? Yes, absolutely. So uh, Pedro is asking, um, you know, he'd like to know which foundations should the value proposition of a local football club have to increase fan engagement, brand awareness, as opposed to, say, a major international club like LFC? I'm not sure it's that different. Ultimately, it comes down to the authenticity of the story of the club. What is the heart of the foundation? What is the root strength? Of, of a football club? Why is it relevant to fans? Why do they come to the game every Sunday? Why do they live through joy, anger, and tears? Why, do they, why are they passionate about it? Why do they pass on the, um, the love for a certain club to, to their family? It's, it's in that value proposition that, that you find the actual foundation of, of a club. And that's not any different to Liverpool Football Club. Some clubs have a longer lasting story. Some clubs have a, um, have a, have a deeper story. Some clubs have a positive or, or, or a negative story. Um, in both, there is a lot of foundation for, for what you can build on going forward. So some clubs have a, don't have such a history, but in the new world of football, all of a sudden they have a, they have a really important position uh, as they manifest themselves as important clubs. So their story might be the future. Their story might be innovation. Um, it really depends on the root strengths, and um, it's usually the people in the club that will help you um, pinpoint exactly what that foundation is. Okay, great. Thank you, Pedro, for that question. Another question from David Woody that came in from email by email uh, beforehand, and he says, how does a football club market, uh, sorry, how does a team use data to grow its brand and reach KPI goals. So this is going back to, you know, the the, the topic you talked about, digital transformation and uh, you know data. So, in your opinion, um, what what are those KPIs and how does the brand grow, uh, particularly with the use of data? Yes, I mean data sits obviously at the at the heart of of everything we do in marketing. When when I compare my days in marketing in the early days. Um, I would have to say it was a little bit sexier. It was about big billboards. It was about um, clips and videos and films and um, flying to South Africa for fantastic shoots. That has changed a little bit. Marketing has become much more data driven, much more factual. So the entire data infrastructure of, of a club, especially when it comes to direct fan relations is obviously fundamental and key. Um, direct fan relation means making sure that a real dialogue is open with fans, making sure that the behaviors of fans are clear to the club so the club and the marketing team can actually cater to, to what the fans really care about because that's what's important. It, it, data to me is a tool to make sure we listen to fans every day.
in their behavior, in their critique, in giving us shit storms, because it happens as well. Um, everything is a holistic picture of fans that, that gives us knowledge on a daily basis to make sure that we can do a better job the next day. So in that sense, we're dissecting data, um, we have been dissecting data um, all, all the time. It is really modernizing how we do it, making sure we turn data into insights. Um, it's not necessarily only about the amount, it's of what you get out of that data. So we have a huge research group that actually turn that data into manageable insights and tell us marketeers what those numbers actually mean. Um, and like I said, data sits at the sits at the heart of everything we do. In terms of the KPIs, we're obviously measuring everything when it comes to the sentiment of conversation, the amount of conversations that we have. Uh, we measure how people react to to the, the reality of football, which is victory or defeat. Um, I can tell you, we get feedback when we lose, um, and that is a that's an interesting world on a Monday morning sometimes. And everything that was that was correct on a Friday potentially looked fundamentally different on a Monday simply because emotion kicks in. So marrying the emotion of football with the data reality is probably that balance that we have to strike in, in making sure that fans um, get what they need from the club. Right, right. And you know, we see some organizations in sport, you know, if you look at FIFA, you look at UEFA, they they hire. Um, you know, they've hired digital transformation, um, you know, professionals to come in and, and uh, deliver uh, this. Uh, others um, do it in-house, uh, while others hire external consultants. So what, what do you see as the trend in general in the industry? How is it being managed uh, from the club side? I think I've seen and heard um, pretty, much, pretty much all of it. Like you said, some do it completely in-house if they have the capability. Some uh, bring, in, bring in the experts that have the proven capability and some do a combination. To be very honest, when, when we embarked on that journey, we decided to actually do it in a combination of things. We needed to firstly decide what that digital proposition was going to be. What does the fan actually really want from us? What is the journey of that fan? How do hundreds of millions of fans around the world consume um, content stories of Liverpool football clubs, how do they consume games when they're around the world? And only when we understand that, we can come back with a, with a digital proposition and after talking to fans and having, I don't know, hundreds of focus groups, it, it, it was literally that many, uh, we were able to define the digital proposition for, for the club. That, that, that part of the work, I think, is something that has to be done within the four walls of the club with outside help and support, but ultimately the nucleus of, of the, the foundation of it all kind of sits internally. Then quickly, when, once this is defined, um, I think what we did quite well was to actually press, pressure test that digital proposition to actually see whether it's relevant. Do people like it? Again, into focus groups, into research. Um, are we on the right track? Are we wrong? If we're wrong, how do we change? How do we move on? So this was a long, um, I would say, soul searching exercise for probably around four to five months. We really took the time to, to go deep. Um, the sports side was involved, the research side was involved, and the coaching side was involved, and then obviously the business staff. So it was a fairly rounded bit, bit of work. And then also, then we brought in a couple of agencies that also helped us to shape it, to understand what's happening out there, in the world to make sure we get a wider dimension as well. And then last but not least, once we decided, then we had to look at ourselves and say, okay, what capability do we have within the club when it comes to digital transformation and making us future-proof and, and modernize everything we do in marketing? And are, can we honestly say that we have it all or do we have to move outside? And, and this is what we decided. We then had to uh, decide to move outside to partner up with the likes of IBM at the time to make sure that we uh, have a partner that can deliver the technology proposition and the underlying uh, foundation for technology, the data um, strategy, but then also, last, last but not least, and often forgotten, the way how a club operates in that new world. Because 
I think what businesses often do in, in digital transformation, they decide what they want to build, they create the engine to, to actually make it work, they create the data strategy, that's all fine, but sometimes what, what stays on the periphery is the actual need to take the team on board to be actually able to, to, to steer that new ship that has just been built. Mm -hmm. um, and that whole training element, making sure we're getting the right capability from a, from a human resource perspective into the club was also an important exercise. How do we train our people? How do we develop our people? How do we bring new people in where we decide we don't have the skills? Interesting, interesting. Um, you touched upon the point about international fans, and there's a question here that Adam L. Spencer uh, is asking. So thank you, Adam, for your question. And he says, when marketing the club in general sense, what is the greatest difference in how you strategize marketing for your local fan base against that international fan base all across the world? The greatest difference, unfortunately, is that most of the international fans will have a hard time to ever making it to Anfield. Um, the example of Liverpool Football Club or many of the other leading teams around the world, they have hundreds of millions of fans around the world and they follow them passionately. And in an ideal world, we would all like to invite them to the biggest stadium on earth, but it doesn't exist and it's just not that easy. So we, we need to understand the, the distance, but in understanding the distance, we need to understand the cultural differences, the simple things like the time differences when they consume a football game at a completely different time um, during the day. What does that mean for their fan journey as they, as they move towards a football game? So simple things like that. How do we um, provide a mobile or digital or broadcast experience that makes them feel close to the club when they will most likely, um, well, unlikely make it to, to Anfield ever if you're in Jakarta or somewhere else in the world. Um, local fans, that's a very, very close relationship. So obviously we're working a lot in the community. The club works a lot in the, in the space of making sure that the neighbors are, are actually connected to the clubs. We even have a program that's called Red Neighbors. We work in the city, we work in the country, we work with a foundation, um, we work with our football schools. And Liverpool Football Club has the ambition to be very, very close to their fans wherever they can be. And when it comes to international fans, that means that we're obviously taking the team on, on the international tours um, in, in the US or in Asia, alternating usually, making sure that we have um, the opportunity for fans to get close at least once a year um, when, when they can get close, um, given the distance throughout the rest of the year. And then also with our partners. Um, Liverpool's partners are very closely working on activation act, activation uh, activities um, with with the club to make sure that international fans get um, content, get insights, get stories, and therefore also provide um, support from their brand perspective to make sure that the fans are actually catered for. Okay, great, great. Uh, there's still some. Uh... Lots of good questions coming in, so feel free to put them in the chat box. As I said, if you have questions, there's there's one here from Juan, Juan Withron. Nice to see you, Juan. He's uh, connecting from Orlando, Florida, uh, and he's a member of the SBI Global Community because he's attended numerous of our webinars. And his question is about the New Balance partnership. And he says, well, um, Liverpool and New Balance have been partners since 2015-16, and the current contract expires this season. Uh, he goes on to say, with Liverpool's success, do you think it makes sense, uh, more financial sense, to continue with New Balance or um, potentially explore opportunities with Nike, Adidas? Any thoughts on that? Well, obviously, what I, what I can do is go any, anywhere near um, the depth of the discussions that we, uh, that we had with, with any brands. One thing is for sure, um, success breeds opportunity for for the club um, as well as for for our partners from uh, from the sports from the sports side, the sports brand side. Um, ultimately, it will have to be a brand decision by New Balance to to decide whether and how they they move on with with the club. But they have been a tremendous partner for Liverpool Football Club in, in the past years. Um, it has been joint growth. Um, the development of the product has, has hugely progressed, so they've been a 
fantastic partner and and are rightly surfing the wave of success with, with the club and both the club and, and the partner are surfing, surfing the wave together. Um, it's hard to predict what the future will, will bring. Um, but as media says, as you know from, from media, there's always, um, there's always discussions in all sorts of directions and that's not different in any, in any football club. Right, okay, uh, excellent. Then uh, Nikolai uh, Jawowski, he asks a question that is more in line to uh, the tips on you know, how to get ahead. And he says, what would be the best approach, he says, uh, to, let me just read this correctly. How would you approach clubs or football associations for an internship when you don't necessarily have those business relationships with, you know, in those decision-making positions? So what would be your advice, Marcus? Yeah, you're, you're right. It's not, it's, it's a fair and good question. It's just, it's just not that simple. Ultimately, I think there is value in going to um, football community or football networking events. Um, as with every networking event, there is the good ones and the bad ones. Um, that's that's definitely one opportunity to make sure that that you make a make contact, that you connect with with right stakeholders in the industry, keep the contact warm. But then ultimately, also with programs like like with the SBI, to me, this is this is an opportunity. Um, to meet industry stakeholders, um, you've just presented before um, the wide array of people and expertise that you have with the with with the SBI, and I think that's an opportunity to to jump on board with with membership uh, with mentorship support to to meet those people either face to face or online and really build a relationship that that can be bene beneficial for the future. Um, so ultimately. It will be these programs, it will be these sorts of events, and to be very honest, there will always be a fair bit of luck involved. It just, it just doesn't happen by the rule book. No, that's a really good point, and uh, I would just add that, uh, yeah, it's, it's important to add to your personal brand, and uh, one of the things that, you know, as I was talking before about our master's program and some of the other courses that we deliver, um, what we help you is we accelerate that path, because gaining those contacts uh, acquiring the knowledge, you know, having the mentorship, being able to have experience. It's, you know, doing it on, on our own uh, by ourselves can be a daunting task. So that's the reason why we've created SBI to help, you know, uh, professionals such as yourself, Nikolai, that uh, could potentially benefit from, you know, uh, having that opportunity all packaged in uh, and, uh, you know, having uh, those, uh, those resources available to you. So thank you for that question, Nikolai. Okay, well, um, let's just continue moving, uh, moving down the list. There's so many here that we're trying to, trying to select and get to most of them. Um, there was, okay, which are the, this is a good one from Agustin. We haven't talked about this market, but which are the biggest opportunities that you find in the Latin American marketing? Um, whether it is, I guess, for, for Liverpool FC or just in sports marketing in general? I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Marcus. Latin America is is obviously key for any football club simply because um, a lot of football, most of the football clubs in any way, shape, or form have Latin American players. Uh, the second they do, there is a there is a direct connection to to the local fans. There is a great sense of positive sports patriotism in countries like Brazil, Argentina, Central America. And that positive sports patriotism is, is really a springboard for, for any club to connect with. So we see immediate impact on our fan base if we bring in people from either players from Latin America or players from Africa. Um, and that connection is obviously hugely important. So there is, as part of our internationalization strategy, there is the, the key market definition of where we want to act no matter what, but then there's also always a, a definition of core markets that are developing simply because players come into our team and we see the opportunities for the next two to three years and we get the passion from, from that country all of a sudden. Obviously, Egypt is the best example. Egypt wasn't a huge community for Liverpool Football Club before Mo Salah joined. When he joined, everything exploded in that sense, in a, in a positive way, obviously. So that would be the same in, in Latin America with, with our Brazilian players like, like Alisson, like Firmino. Um, that's, that's pretty much the same mechanism. 
Okay, excellent. Good question. Good question. We have uh, one from Justin, and he says, do you think offline marketing, I know you, you sort of alluded this, to this before, but uh, do you think offline marketing is dying, and how much importance do you put on digital marketing? Uh, obviously, the importance of digital marketing is, is tremendous. Um, I'm a firm believer that offline marketing is not dying. Um, offline marketing and the balance of the digital and the offline and the online world is especially evident in the football club where, where it's about creating great experiences for, for young audiences, emotional experience, but also physical experiences. For clubs, pretty much all the clubs, the major clubs around the world have a foundation program whereby they support um, underprivileged kids around the world. Um, clubs have football schools. All of that, I wouldn't even call that offline marketing, but it is an, an offline connection to, to the next generation of fans. Um, football clubs, I don't think, will ever stop that because I think there's a fundamental responsibility to make kids move, and who better than a football club can do that credibly. Um, the fact that the digital world will be the, the constant companion in all of this is, is a given. It's just the world we're living in. So I don't think one will be surviving or the other one will be dying. It will be the balance of the two that, uh, that will prevail. Okay. Okay, good question. Interesting. Um, we have one from Andre, and he says, going back to the challenge of uh, global, is there any sense of setting up social media accounts for different regions, countries with unique content, or is it better to be uniform? Um, we, well, at the time, similar to other clubs, uh, Liverpool Football Club has gone through a certain journey in setting up up to 27, for example, Facebook accounts that we had um, that were managed partially locally, partially centrally with localized content and so on and so forth. Um, and then at the time we did a bit of a, we took a step back and did a bit of a research and wanted to understand whether people wanted to have bespoke content only or whether they felt they wanted to be part of the, the bigger, wider global pic picture of, of the club at the time. And it turned out that the fan base actually, actually decided for us that it was better to tone down or, or reduce the amount of um, bespoke country irrelevant social sites and bring it back a little more centrally because the main thing that fans um, are worried about is the fear of missing out. The fear of missing out of some great content that we show in one entity and they might miss out because they're not in the global, in the global entity. So in that sense, um, we've kind of pulled back and moved from uh, 27 different accounts for Facebook as an example to seven and very much feeding it from, from a global perspective only. And we've had um, tremendous success with that because people now feel they're, they're in, in the heart of the information, they're in the heart of the storytelling, and they're not getting a, a localized version of something that is actually better to be listened to and watched to when it comes from the, from the beating heart of the club. Okay. Okay, excellent. Maybe we have time for uh, just a couple more. Um, another question that came in from Jonas, and he said, um, if you had perhaps, say, three examples of other clubs that um, you find are also uh, leading the way besides Liverpool as to how they uh, uh, take on their marketing, their communication with their activations, are there any other clubs that perhaps you benchmark with or that you just personally thought they're doing a great job? Yeah, I think there is, a, it's interesting, a, a small club in Germany called FC San Pauli, which is, a, you know, a second division club in, in Hamburg, um, the, definitely the smaller club in a big city. They have managed to position themselves from a, from a brand and marketing perspective in a very, very unique way. Um, they don't have the big funds. They don't have, they don't have the opportunities to drive uh, an international marketing beast like all, all the big clubs uh, around the world. What they do have is attitude. And what they do have is the, they don't have the fear of being brave. They don't have, they, they position the brand in a very, very unique way, in a much more sustainable alternative way when it comes to, when it comes to football. Um, and they had great successes with that. So it's, it's definitely a, a football brand 
that has developed from a, from a smaller club in Germany, which I always like to like to watch and see what they do. Very innovative, very brave, and and new when it, and fresh when it comes to content. Um, they have a skull as their logo, as their club crest. So um, they were brave there as well, uh, and they're communicating it. It's a it's a very nice marketing case. But again, coming back to the point I made before, it's not a marketing case in terms of plonking a marketing idea over a club. It has been born out of the authenticity, out of the story of Hamburg, out of the story of the underdog, and taking that position with passion and deliberately is what they've done. So I think they were really, they were a good example of a smaller club that has actually done that really well. Um, I do think that um, from coming to the bigger clubs, Bayern Munich is doing a, a, a very good job when it comes to their to their media output. Um, for sure, very, very modern, very clear in their position. Um, and then recently, I watched a little more of of, AC, of Inter Milan when it comes to uh, their content. Um, and there has been a positive shift there as well uh, when it comes to positioning the club in a way they basically use the claim which is called uh, not for everyone um, and making it making it exclusive making it clear that they are disruptive they are specific about who they are I think is a strong position as well that however was very subjective <laughs> <laughs> Right, right, right. No, that's a good question, and I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's some good examples there. So, uh, I see São Paulo, Bayern Munich, uh, Inter Milan. I would also add that AS Roma is one that we tend to look at and see what they're doing, and they're doing phenomenal stuff. And uh, not to be biased because we're based in Barcelona, but we also enjoy the content of, of FC Barcelona, and particularly Instagram. They do a great job. The former SBI student is is leading the way there. Uh, and uh, managing the, the Instagram account for FC Barcelona. So uh, we always like to follow them as well. But anyway, perhaps we have um, time for one more question that came uh, earlier, and I forget who asked it, so I'm sorry if I don't have the name, but they asked, and perhaps we can, we can close off with this question, Marcus, is what has been your most exciting project that, that you've worked in the industry and uh, perhaps that you wanted to share with uh, our audience tonight? I think uh, the, the, I'm showing my age here. I guess there has been quite a few, quite a few projects. I must say, the first time uh, that I received the responsibility at Nike to to lead for for a sub region, the World Cup 2006 project uh, for Northern Europe at the time was obviously important for for many reasons. One, it was at the time the most important thing that Nike did. Secondly, it was uh, the World Cup in my my homeland, so there was a there was a connection there anyway, and it was obviously the moment where at the time Nike decided to um, go head to head with their biggest competitor in in Germany, um, Adidas. So it was a very interesting, um, positive battle of the football forces when it comes from when it comes to the brand side. Um, there was another one uh, at HTC and uh, at the time, smartphone brand. They decided to position their brand around football, but they didn't have the, the skills, the knowledge, the network. Um, pretty much, they they didn't do sports marketing before um, before that moment. But they decided that it was hugely important for them to position themselves in football and use football as a catapult for their brand. Um, to be able to lead that from a from a partnership perspective, when it comes to the partnership with the UEFA Champions League and Europa League at the time, was was tremendously challenging. Um, and starting it off with a with a very small sports marketing team, um, and, and really almost building a sports marketing strategy for a non football brand with very limited football experience from scratch was was very exciting. Um, and I couldn't stop without. Uh, saying the project of winning the Champions League was fantastic and I can tell you I had zero involvement but um, uh, everything else was exciting. Fantastic Mark as well thank you very much for uh, for taking the time to um, be our guest here for our webinar tonight um, I'd also like to, um, to, to thank our audience for the great questions and uh, the excellent engagement that we always tend to get in these types of webinars and, and the the uh, the experience that gets enriched by the, the great questions that come up from um, everybody involved tonight. 
Um, one last thing, as I mentioned before, we have our master's program. If you are thinking about a career in the business side of football, um, as I mentioned before, Marcus is going to play an important role with SBI. He's going to be an academic advisor. He's going to be a mentor. He's going to guest lecture, as you just saw in this last question. You know, so much uh, information, uh, some of the cases that he shared with, whether it's with LA, uh, Liverpool or with HTC or Nike, Adidas. You know, he's, he's seen um, quite a number of different experiences through his journey in sports marketing. So uh, um, anyway, if you're interested, just get in touch with us. Uh, let us know. We'll be interested to know more about your aspirations, what you'd like to do. Here's our team. Um, as you can see, myself, Emma, our international programs coordinator, and Chavi, who is involved in our marketing team. Um, so get in touch with us. Let us know if you uh, are thinking about a career transition, if you're already working in football but like to expand beyond your area of expertise and grow, be in a position of leadership, have the confidence to you know, have the conversations with decision makers. That's what we provide and that's uh, how we optimize your opportunities. Finally, I'd like to say uh, once again, thank you to all involved tonight, both from our team that helped put together this webinar, Marcus, of course, for being here and sharing his experiences with us, and all of you guys who took the time to connect. And if uh, you registered for this webinar, but you didn't attend and will be watching the replay, shout out to you as well. Looking forward to engaging in the next session. So Marcus, thanks once again. Look forward to uh, continuing our conversations. Thanks a lot also from my side. Thanks a lot for everyone for listening in for, for the good questions. And I hope to see some of you in, uh, in one of the courses. Fantastic. All the best, Marcus. I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll connect soon enough. So all the best. Thanks, Ega.